Rogue River has its origins on the west side of Southern Oregon's Cascade Divide in a large area that encompasses Crater Lake National Park. The river flows for 215 miles through the Cascade, Siskiyou, and coastal mountains and reaches the Pacific Ocean at Gold Beach not far from the Oregon-California border. Along with its sister rivers in the area, the Klamath and the Umpqua, it drains a large part of southwest Oregon. What makes the Rogue unique is its designation in 1968 as a National Wild and Scenic River. This has assured that 84 miles of this river's length is flowing through forested mountains and rugged, rocky gorges where there is little to suggest man's impact on its scenic beauty. This was one reason that we were drawn into signing up for a rafting trip with Echo River Trips on the Rogue. The other attraction was Lori Lewis and her partner Tom Rosam's participation in the rafting trip. They are a widely popular duo of bluegrass and folk music recording and performing artists. For those attracted to both the scenic beauty of this particular river and good bluegrass, the draw was irresistible. All of us met on a warm July morning at the designated gathering point on the river, the little town of Galice, which is a popular rafting trip launching site and consists of an inn and even a small market and a post office. Galice is located about 20 miles downriver from Grants Pass and 7 miles above the entrance of Grave Creek, which marks the upstream beginning of the wild and scenic area of the river. Helping to distinguish our group from several others were the instrument cases being carried. We, Dennis and Jennifer Johnson, carried a mandolin. I retired almost 20 years ago as a veterinarian from the National Institutes of Health to Port Townsend, Washington. Jennifer had many careers in teaching, editing, finance, and we both spend a lot of time now doing music together. Coming from Port Townsend with us were our friends David and Ruth Whitney. David is a semi-retired orthopedic surgeon, and Ruth has authored Slim, a fictional novel about AIDS in Africa. They enjoy the active Northwest outdoor lifestyle and what it offers for kayaking, skiing, fishing, bicycle touring, hunting, and simply enjoying the beautiful scenery and climate. Recognizing Gregory Johnson, who had driven up from his home in Berkeley, was easy because he was carrying a guitar and because he's our son. Greg is an executive and the founder of GT Nexus, an Oakland-based firm that provides a global computer-based network to support trade and logistics. In addition to being active in the outdoors, he's also a vocalist and guitarist who enjoys all types of contemporary music, even bluegrass. Ron Marks joined up with his dobro in hand. He told us he grew up wanting to be a philosopher prince, to understand the biomechanics of sea creatures and to play the French horn, which was not in evidence. For serious stuff, he delivers high resolution to fussy researches in the South San Francisco Bay Area while composing and decomposing acoustic music, mostly involving resophonic guitar. We guessed that included dobros. Mary Boucher came carrying her mandolin all the way from nearby Talent, Oregon where she's a mom and works as a cardiology nurse at the Rogue Valley Medical Center in Medford. She's also a music lover and wannabe bluegrass mandolin player and clogger, who loves nature, birds, rivers, and adventures that engage the mind, body, and soul. Peter Meyer and his wife Nancy brought his banjo all the way from Washington, D.C., in spite of security restrictions on that particular class of instrument. Peter, who turned out to be one of two lawyers on the trip, works with the Federal Department of Justice. His encyclopedic knowledge of bluegrass music led to some concerns, unfounded, it turned out, about having our copyright releases handy. Mary works with an endodontic practice in Chevy Chase, Maryland, and they love opera together, which they admitted did not explain their presence on the trip. Finally, there were readily recognizable Lori Lewis and her partner Tom Rosam, also from Berkeley, California. In addition to real talent, they added a fiddle, mandolin, and another guitar to the collection. The evidence was clear that, as advertised, 
bluegrass music was going to be a key element of the trip along with the scenery and the white water. The six other couples who came to join the group had a last chance to opt out, but none of them did. All held up their right hands and professed allegiance to Bill Monroe and bluegrass music. They included Daryl Carrington and Mary Myers, he an architect, and she an academic landscape architect from the Philadelphia area. They both have a strong interest in sustainable design and outdoor activities. Dennis Keating, a legal professor of urban planning and law, and Kay Martin, a librarian and identifiable by her large camera at the ready, came from the Cleveland area. This was to be their third river trip with Tom and Lori, so music was certainly on their agenda. Michael and Maria Olson came from New York and careers in the public school system where they met and worked. He said he was a former New York taxi driver and was accordingly very comfortable with facing whitewater. They admitted to drifting down the great life of river together, another more subtle reason that brought them to the road. Brian Olson, Michael's brother, and Mary Barlow were almost retired Berkeleyites. Brian came with a background in residential construction and views fully consistent with the political fabric of Berkeley, as well as far-left interests in integrating polyrhythmic drumming into bluegrass music. He'd come without percussion portfolio. Mary, Brian's partner, came from a varied career as an educator, social worker, and restaurant manager. Jeff and Cindy Lewis came from Templeton on California's Central Coast, where he retired from a career in the aerospace industry and she continues to provide assistance in her national business to students seeking educations in the health professions. Gary and Pam Cruz were from Northern California's town of Reading. He's a West Air pilot and she is a registrar for the trauma unit of the local hospital. Both confessed that a love of Lori and Tom's music and things outdoors had brought them to our meeting in Galice. Our leader for the trip was Jenny Harris, one of ECHO's veterans, who introduced herself to the assembled group. Moving from Tennessee to the West Coast in 2001 to pursue interests like skiing and outdoor sports, we assumed, correctly it turned out, that she would still be comfortable with songs in the genre of Rocky Top, Tennessee's national anthem. Jenny got us into several vans for the short trip to the launch site after all the folks from Berkeley assured consensus had been reached. Upon arriving at the launch site, Jenny familiarized the group with the essentials of the trip. The rest of her crew of five dealt with campsite acquisition and readying the watercraft for our departure. This included loading an estimated two tons of gear, baggage, and food onto several of the trip's large inflatable rafts. Particular attention and care was given to the protecting of musical instruments to avoid any possibility of their coming in contact with and contaminating the wild and scenic river water. Jenny explained that, while peeing directly into the river was encouraged with discretion, the other major type of body waste was to be deposited directly into special high-security Groover tanks that would be later transported to designated sanitary waste disposal sites safely beyond the reach of the river. Most importantly, the Groover could only be accessed in a special tent remotely set up at the edge of camps and protected from untimely intrusions, for example, from any bears, with an occupied signal, easily understood by bears, consisting of a paddle stuck upright in the access trail. Everyone agreed that this was a good idea. Another item dealt with modes of transportation, of which there were three. First class, which provided a luxurious seat for two on one of the gear transport barges and required nothing more than watching the scenery go by and letting the guide do all the navigating. Second class provided at least six seats on one of the crude rafts where everyone paddled, more or less, under the direction of the guide. Steerage was voluntary assignment to one of the five rubber duckies, or inflatable single kayaks. This provided for the greatest freedom of expression and risk and its consequences. 
However, rubber duckies had to closely follow the raft designated as mother ducky, follow the directions given by the mother ducky guide, and assume the proper heads up, bottoms down, hang on to boat and paddle position in the water in the event of capsizing. It was good policy. The necessary details being covered, people donned their gear, manned the boats, pushed off, and set out down the river. A little less than two miles downstream, we entered the 34-mile stretch of river designated as wild, and the first of five stretches of significant whitewater that we would see for the day, one of them being Rainy Falls, which was the only Class 5 rapid of the trip. Our experience on this one was from the walking trail around it, and watching as the guides bypassed the falls through a fish ladder channel that had been blasted through the rocks many years ago. Particularly appreciated was guide Nick Lorenz's successful navigation of the fast, narrow, overgrown channel with his fully loaded raft carrying the wine, draft beer, and most importantly, the groover. A fiery redhead born and raised native of Oregon, Nick was a veteran of three years with Echo and a college student in Vermont with interest in making pottery, farming, and the brewing and love of beer. Just below Rainy Falls, we entered the Class 4 Taiyi Rapids and one ducky rider went swimming. We made our first camp at Taiyi, just below the rapids and about five miles below Grave Creek, while probably qualifying as a primitive campsite because it was without bathrooms, showers, or king-sized Tempur-Pedic mattresses, the experience that awaited us for the night at Taiyi deserved a five-star rating. For openers, guide J.R. Weir laid out a delicious sushi bar that he had prepared complete with even a bonsai tree. No one was ever sure of what J.R.'s initials stood for, but probably had a relationship to his father's name, a judge in Crescent City. An accomplished kayaker and instructor with a quick wit and a knack for opening the eyes of people to the magic of the river, he convinced everyone of his credentials as well in the culinary arts. The rest of the dinner was teriyaki salmon, in keeping with the native word taiyi for the site, meaning fresh king salmon. The occasion of Jeff's <clears throat> birthday was also celebrated with a dessert of Dutch oven baked chocolate cake. In a pattern that would be followed at each of the three campsites, Lori Lewis and Tom Rosam sang and played their beautiful duets and sets before and after dinner, accompanied only by the sounds of the river and artfully coinciding with beautiful sunsets and the emergence of starry skies. Awed by their performance, the wannabe bluegrass artists, also along on the trip, got good marks for restraining themselves from joining in. However, they did find ample opportunity to make their own musical contributions in the morning and late afternoon jams, and Lori and Tom were consistently good sports for joining in on these and improving the mix. Departure from Taiyi on the second day followed a generous breakfast, the morning jam, and breaking camp. The first stop was about four miles downriver at Big Windy, where there was a large rocky outcropping rising straight up from a deep pool in the river, a perfect place for most of the company to ignore any latent acrophobia and take a long plunge into the river, which most of the company did. Amy Keepers got a good spot at the bottom for taking pictures. Amy, who photographed well, is a Utah girl studying nursing during the school year in Salt Lake City. And besides river guiding in the summer, she kayaks, plays the mandolin, and mountain bikes. Below Big Windy, with guide Nate Wilson at the helm of the Mother Ducky, who took on four stretches of whitewater before lunch. Nate, a charmer and adventuring wanderer with origins in South Carolina, has been kayaking since he was 14. No duckies were lost on his watch. Lunch was on the riverbank at Little Horseshoe about two and a half miles further on. Two miles beyond that, a stop was also made in mid-afternoon to see the cabin Zane Gray owned at Winkle Bar. 
In addition to being one of the most popular writers of Western fiction, Gray was devoted to fly fishing for steelhead and spent a lot of his time on the road. We went on to cover our longest stretch of the river that day, about 14 miles, passing through 11 class 2 and 4 class 3 stretches of whitewater. Our camp that evening was at Missouri Bar. The campsite order of events followed the previous evening with brie and goat cheese appetizers, grilled tri-tips with mashed potatoes and fresh asparagus for dinner, augmented with another evening of pleasurable music from Lori and Tom. In addition to breakfast under bright blue skies, the next morning brought to light the talent of guide Donnie Simpkin at the pre-departure jam. In addition to playing guitar, Donnie was a native of Los Angeles, coached crew at Stanford, and was an Olympic hopeful in 2009 for the U.S. national team for rowing. The day ahead was a challenging one, promising nine class two, one class three, and three class four rapids on 12 miles of the river that we were to cover during the day. About three miles downstream, we stopped at the Rogue River Ranch at the entrance to Mule Creek. The 70-acre ranch was originally homesteaded in 1887, and the main building, restored by the BLM after purchasing the tract in 1970, served as an early trading post and post office, accessed from downstream by both mule and water. The ranch serves as a visitor center and headquarters for the federal agencies that manage the protected area. The vegetable garden was impressive. Lunch was staged at Eagle Cove, several miles further downstream, allowing everyone an hour or so of good relaxation before facing the rigors of Mule Creek Canyon and the beginning of the most challenging stretch of whitewater on the trip. The middle of them? No. That scares me a lot. <laughs> the first of these rapids was Mule Creek Narrows. Next rapid was called Coffee Pot, named because of its resemblance to a rocky sieve. Okay, this is the coffee pot up here. <laughs> nice position. I like that position. Probably won't be able to hold it.
excellent to play. Everyone relaxed as we tucked into a rocky crevice with a pretty waterfall. Waiting for us just below was the next stretch of fast water, the Class 4 Blossom Bar. It is described in the BLM float guide as the most famous and feared rapid on the river, a place that had been blasted clear many years ago to make it passable for mail boats. Echoes and Schur placed some restrictions on the passage. For the second time on the trip, Duckies and their operators were loaded onto rafts for the passage, and everyone fastened his seatbelt. Everyone made it and were cheered by bystanders on the cliffs above as they emerged from the experience to celebrate with high fives. The last campsite for the trip was reached several miles downstream at Camp Tacoma, which boasted the luxury of a genuine Forest Service sit-on-top comfort station complete with four walls, a door, and a lock. It could have served, if necessary, as a refuge from the bears that were sighted several times along the river in this area. While only about 11 miles of the river were traveled during the third day, the day was certainly a good one for excitement and appetite building. The prelude to the evening began with a habit-forming pre-dinner Louis Rosam concert accompanied by chips, salsa, guacamole, and a fortified punch. They were joined by all members of the party and guides attired in unusual garments chosen from a large assortment tossed on the ground and likely selected from a Salvation Army warehouse fire sale. This garb would set the stage for the much heralded and climactic talent show scheduled to follow that evening after a satisfying dinner of grilled chicken fajitas. The show allowed ample opportunity for self-expression and, occasionally, intimate insights about our new friends on the river. The sounds of music persisted well after the show and slowly faded as flickering flashlights and movement were superseded by sleep. Breakfast on the last day had a somewhat relaxed air to it, perhaps because there were only about six miles more to float on the trip before the takeout at Foster's Bar. As usual, the morning jam was good and set the stage for the most peaceful stretch of the river we had seen, Play Hill Stillwater, which began less than a mile below pushing off. For this, the rafts were tied together and Lori and Tom played their duets for about the next hour as their sound echoed in the stillness and the boats drifted lazily downstream. Even the occasional bear took notice. A good lunch of chips and tacos was consumed before taking on the last stretch, which included just several more Class II and one Class III rapids. They were traversed without incident. It seemed everyone was becoming a veteran and that the greatest challenge was avoiding the tourist field as distinguished from us, mail boats that we met roaring upstream. Reaching Foster's Bar had a hint of nostalgia to it as we all posed for the class picture together, changed into more normal travel attire, and got things together for the 50 mile van trip back over the mountains to Belize. The road trip was a sightseeing excursion in itself, including arriving to see an overturned van recovered and going over a roughly 5,000 foot pass. But the trip was over and time to say goodbye to folks with whom we had shared a very special four days. A unique experience that, even if we tried to do it again, could never be the same. Rogue River, Rogue River, Rogue River.
Frog River we love your frothy green waters and clear skies above. We fly and we drive and we travel afar to endanger our lives on Blossom Bar. Rogue River, Rogue River, Rogue River we love your frothy green waters and clear skies above. Our leaders are Jenny, J.R., Nick, and Nate. With Amy and Donnie, they're ever so great. In oar boats and duckies, we challenge the stream with a smelly old groover and gourmet cuisine. Rogue River, Rogue River, Rogue River, we love your frothy green waters and clear skies above. We paddle and paddle without any fear, knowing they'll feed us and give us some beer. Through eddies and boils and waves we will glide, taking all the white water quite calmly in stride. Rogue River, Rogue River, Rogue River, we love your frothy green waters and clear skies above. The people are lovely, the music divine. With gladness and sadness we leave them behind. Rogue River, Rogue River, Rogue River, we love your frothy green waters and clear skies above.